welcome to Katrina's Creations. And if this is if you're a return viewer, I appreciate you for coming back. And if you're a first time viewer, thanks for stopping by. Uh, if you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button down below. And we're going to get started. Uh, today is going to be maybe longer than normal. Uh, we'll have to see because I am going to do a little, something a little different. I'm going to do a little with teaching and um, educational stuff today. So first off, let's get started with finished objects. I only have one. I thought I was going to have two. Remember the um, Kool-Aid shawl that I've talked about in my other episodes? It almost bit the dust this week. Um, I was trying frantically to get it finished. I was so close. So I thought it was done and I was three rows into the edging and realized that the pattern wasn't looking right. It wasn't falling into place. And when I held the shawl up and looked at it from a distance, I realized I had gotten off of the pattern like 10 rows back and I kept correcting for it, but it wasn't, nothing was falling in line. It wasn't the pattern's fault. It was the operator. So definite operator error. But I had to rip it out like 10 rows. So, yeah. So I put it away. But I have come to one conclusion with it. Um, it's a very busy colorway to begin with. And it's a very busy shawl pattern with the lace. I think if I was to do it over again, I would do it in something solid. Or I would use the colorway and knit it like in a stockinette or a garter stitch, something that would show off the colors a little bit more than, than what's happening with this. So anyway, I did not finish that. I ended up ripping out more than I'd put in. Um, the baby shawl that I was, or the baby afghan I was working on at this point is definitely going to be for my niece uh, because I got a note in the mail for an invitation to a baby shower. And the baby shower is going to be before my daughter-in-law is it? do with her baby so the baby afghan is going to go to her this is how far i have gotten on it since last week you can see where my progress keeper is so i've only got two weeks to get this done yeah i'm going to be doing nothing but knitting this unless she has a really tiny short baby it's not going to work so yeah i got a long ways to go so that being said, I didn't get a whole lot else done, except I got some spinning done. Finally, I got to my spinning wheel. If you remember on the second episode, I talked about um, some wool that I had gotten. It's 100% Merino, and I got it from um, a shop off of eBay. I will put in the notes where it came from, because I don't remember right off the top of my head. Uh, but it looked like Fiesta Wear, and it still looks like Fiesta Wear. I did um, make it kind of variegated, and it is a two-ply. see if I can get this close so you can see the colors. Yeah. So it's kind of a tomato red, and then there's kind of a gold, almost a sweet potato kind of color. And then there are colors like what you would find in a Fiesta Wear pottery. So, yes, that is it. It's two-ply. It is worsted weight. Uh, the funny thing with this yarn is when I was spinning it, I tend to spin at a lace weight. I tend to spin really thin. So when I plied it, I thought I was going to get like a fingering maybe to a sport or sock weight by the time I finished. Um this has a lot of bloom in it but and when i say bloom when you spin um you set it through water and soak it when you finish and then dry it again and it helps set the twist so it doesn't come back out again and when i put it in the water it really bloomed and it ended up like i said ended up a worsted weight um, but it's it's really pretty it's it's definitely fiesta ish looking so I'm actually calling it Feisty Fiesta, and it is going to be in my Etsy shop. Um, I should have it up in the next couple days. Uh, so if you're interested, that's what's going to be up there in the shop. Other than that, I have no finished objects. I bought some material that I'm hoping to make some more project bags. And because I got behind, I had one project bag that I'd hoped to get done because it has turkeys on it. How cute would that have been to have it done 
and it has fall leaves on the other side so turkeys yeah it would have been cute but I didn't get it done in time so maybe by next week but it's not going to be done by Thanksgiving so um that's all I've got as far as any finished objects or works in progress now um I'm going to be talking today like I said it's gonna be something a little bit different I'm going to be talking about different types of wool and fibers in general. Um, there are three types of fibers. There are man-made fibers, there's plant fibers, and there are animal fibers. Now a lot of you that are experienced with yarn and with spinning and things, you're going to know all of this to begin with. But if you aren't, um, I mean I've been spinning and knitting for years, but I still learned a couple things that were interesting when I was studying up for some of this. And instead of doing my regular cozy mysteries at the end, I'm actually going to recommend some adult nonfiction books that have to do with um, spinning and dyeing and different types of yarn, different types of wool. Um, and I'm also going to share, since Christmas is coming, I'm going to share some children's books that have wool and yarn and things like that in them. So let's get started. We're going to talk about man-made fibers first. And if you catch me looking down a lot, it's because I am. Um, I took a lot of notes on this because I knew I would never in my old age remember all of this information. So man-made fibers are actually um, formed by a fatty cellulose material, sort of like um, toilet paper and just squishy fibrous type of thing like that. Um, it's ground or like bamboo they can actually make as as a fiber and spin it or they can make it into a, um, a man-made product uh, where they take the bamboo and they squish it down so it's all mushy the same as any other cellulose fiber and then it's soaked till it turns to mush and then they combine it with chemicals and turn it into fiber so they can do that with man-made fibers like your viscose nylon rayon Things like that, those are considered man-made, synthetic, acrylic, any of those. Uh, but bamboo can also be processed the same way. Now when we get into plants though with bamboo, bamboo and flax can be handled the same way. And flax are reeds that they are sort of like um, bulrushes or cattails. And inside they're hollow and they have a, a stringy sinew type of fiber inside. And bamboo has the same type of thing inside as well. They soak these and then they break them open. When they break them open, they remove those fibers. And then those fibers are combed through, um, it almost looks like nails. That's the easiest way to describe it. They look like nails that they're drug through and they drag off all the, the kind of junk fibers that are in there. Um, it's called toe and they get all of that out. And what's left is what you have as flax. And like I said, bamboo can be processed this way also. I do have some flax. I've never spun with it. I've seen it spun. Um, I really haven't worked up the courage to deal with it because unlike wool where you've got um, barbs on the end of it where it attaches to the next group of fiber very easily, flax doesn't have that. It's very, very long, long, long fibers. And there's no barb to them. They actually connect to each other by glue. The, when the washing process washes out the majority of the glue that's in it, uh, it's a natural glue. It's sort of like aloe. Kind of reminds you of that sticky substance from aloe. This is the same thing. This is flax. I'm going to hold this up to see if you can see it. I mean, you're not going to be able to see real close. You can see little pieces of hair coming off of it uh, where the fiber is rough. This is actually considered... Irish linen flax. Um, linen is used, or flax is used to make linen. And this is supposed to be top grade flax. But it gets joined together by moisture. So what you actually have to do as you spin it is moisten your fingers and run it along the fibers to get that sinew glue to kind of reactivate and then it joins to itself in theory. I've never tried it, but I've seen it done and that's how the lady I watched was doing it. The other types of fibers that you can also spin that are plant fiber would be cotton. And cotton, everybody knows, I think everybody's seen pictures of cotton balls. 
Uh, they're a seed pod. So when they come out of the pod, they have to be run through a cotton gin. And a cotton gin was invented in like the late 1700s up until the 1800s, somewhere in that period. And it actually sorts out the seeds. And once the seeds are taken out of it, um, it also straightens the fibers because just like flax, just like wool, cotton has to have all the fibers going the same direction. If you spin and the fibers are going different directions, you're going to have scratchy material. Um, it just makes it easier when all the fibers are lined up. You get a smoother material when you're finished or smoother yarn. So with cotton, it goes through all of that. And like I said, it goes through a drum and it um, is then turned into the cotton that we know today. But I will tell you with cotton, and I do have some, this is cotton. I have spun with cotton quite often. It is very short fibers. As you can see here, these are short, very short fibers. They're maybe, maybe two inches at best, maybe inch and a half to two inches long. As a result, when you spin with them, you have to spin at a higher rate of speed. So your twists are going to be tighter. If you look at um, like the, the yarn that's used to make doilies out of, that's a cotton fiber. If you look at the twists, they are spun very, very tight. That's why, because the fiber is very small. So then we move on to the different types of wool. Now wool can come from sheep. That's the primary one. It can come from camels. It can come from llama, rabbits, goats, bison, muskox, who knew, and even dogs. Now my mom has a Sheltie and she has told me for years, oh, you could, you could spin the dog's hair that, you know, when it sheds and all the hair goes all over the place. It's like, I'll spin it for you and you can wear it. Um, I spend too much time getting dog hair off of me. I don't want to intentionally put some on, but, but it can, you can get the same type of effect. You can sp spin dog hair. In fact, you can buy it online. You can buy spun dog hair if you so desire. Um, now there's different ways that you can spin wool. It's, it's processed all the same. When the wool comes off of the animal, it gets picked, which means a lot of the um, debris that's in the wool falls out. And when I say debris, it's not just whatever happened to be in the farmyard. It, it can be fecal matter as well, because I mean, it's on an animal. So all of this comes off and then it can be washed and then the fibers straightened out going through a a uh, drum what's it's a, it's a drum it's it's a comb like the the combs that you see in colonial times where people are hand combing these things back and forth there's a drum that can do it at a faster rate of speed um you can spin the wool before it actually gets washed it's called spinning in the grease some people like to do this it does make your hands very very soft but I've done it once. I would never do it again. Um, while my hands are really soft, you have to be very, very careful because of the fact that it has not been cleaned and soaked. There's bacteria in that wool and that bacteria uh, can get in your eyes, in your mouth, in any open wounds. You can get an infection very easily um, if you mishandle it. So. I cheat. I buy my rovings already made and they've already been washed and generally they've even been dyed, although I'm experimenting with dyeing. Um, but that way I don't have to worry about it. I did it one time and like I said, it, it was enough and I enjoyed it, but I don't think I'd do it ever again. So now there's different types of, of wool and that's what I'm going to talk about here is the different types of wool and there's different types of sheep. Um, lately on a lot of the podcasts I've been talk I've been hearing people talk about BFL and I thought, well, what is BFL? It stands for a type of sheep. It's called a blue faced Leicester or Lester, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, so that is a type of sheep that apparently is very popular right now. There's of course Merino, which is the finest of all the, the wools as far as softness. It, it's, there's different classifications of wool from the finest down to the coarsest. Merino is in one of the top ones. Um, Merino wool actually originated in the, the sheep itself originated in Spain and it was domesticated in Australia. And primarily that is where uh, most of your 
sheep that produce merino wool come from is Australia. Um, it is some of the finest and softest wools. Um, it's, it's just a very ultra fine wool is what it's considered. Some of the other sheep that are popular at the, at the present time, you hear Corydale, um, which is used for wool and um, it's also a sheep that's used for meat as well. Merino, not so much because they're a smaller sheep. Um, it's one of the oldest breeds and it is a lot of times crossed with a mix of a Lincoln. So sometimes you'll hear a, a Corydale cross. It just means it's it's a it's a breed that's Corydale plus something else. Um, and they could put it with Merino, they could put it with Lincoln, um, but it's a it's considered a cross breed when it's a Corydale cross. And the other things to tell you about, let's see, there's cashmere and there's Angora. Um, cashmere and Angora actually are, um, they're very fine. There are Angora goats. There are also cashmere goats. There's also Angora rabbits. Uh, I remember going to the Sheep and Wool Festival years ago and I saw this lady with this pile of fur. I mean, it doesn't look like wool. It's, it, it's very, very fine. It's very long. I saw this pile of fur on her lap and she was spinning from this pile of fur on her lap. And then I saw the pile of fur move and realized that it was a rabbit. It was just laying there. I mean, obviously it doesn't hurt to have the dead hair taken off of it. Just like if you were taking dead hair off of a dog, you know, with one of the combing brushes, that's pretty much what she was doing with the rabbit. It was just sitting there and she was spinning directly from the rabbit. Um, the hair off of that, of course, is not going to be like what's coming off of a sheep as far as the bacteria and things. It's going to be a little bit cleaner because it's a domesticated animal and it's more of a pet, so it's not going to be like that. So all of that being said, I thought I would tell you, there's one thing with, um, when you hear superwash, I thought, what in the world? How do we describe what superwash is? Um, most wool you cannot throw in the wash machine, throw in the dryer. You have to hand wash. You have to be very careful with it. A superwash and it can be not just wool, it can be other fibers too, but a superwash means it's been chemically treated so that it can handle the wash and the dry better. It also can help some people who maybe have allergies to wool and can't wear it, can sometimes wear something that's a superwash because it's made it a little bit softer or things that are in the wool that maybe would bother them have been removed by a chemical process. So superwashing just means that it, it's been processed a little bit so that it's easier for care, wear and care. So that being said, one thing I did learn um, about a year ago, my, bro my nephew caught me at church and said, Aunt Katrina, I got you a whole bunch of yarn. I've got a whole trunk load of yarn. Of course, my eyes lit up, you know, yarn. It's like squirrel, you know. <laughs> so after church, he shows me this whole trunk full of yarn. It was two big boxes of yarn. He got it in an auction for a dollar. Yes, a dollar. So I was like really high at that point and excited. And I went, oh, wonderful. And then I got it home and realized it smells like mildew. And I thought before I do anything and spend time knitting something, I want to make sure I can get the mildew smell out. So first I started hand washing all of the skeins of yarn. And I think all total, my daughter and I divided it up. So she took some, I took some. First I divided it up. I didn't have any clue what kind of fibers they were because all of the labels were gone off of all these. These, these were just balls of yarn. Or in some cases, they were, they were not hanks of yarn. Like when you have your, um, like this, they were not like that where you could easily undo them like this and wash them. Now these were, these were like um, processed like through a manufacturer type of skeins of yarn where you can't easily pull them apart to clean them. So I tried soaking them in my sink, tried washing them, laid them all out all over the place. And I probably had about 30 skeins of yarn laying all over the place. No idea what the fibers were. I could tell some of them were wool just by the way they felt um, or the way I could see that they were kind of clinging to each other a little bit. I could tell. But 
they weren't drying and I couldn't, I could still smell the smell. So I thought, okay, this isn't working. So then I thought, I'll put them in the washing machine. So I did. I put them in the washing machine on gentle, on the delicate cycle. They came through fine. And I thought, okay, now I'll lay them out and they'll all get all dry, nice and dry. No, that didn't happen. Because when you've got a skein of yarn that's like one that you buy at the store, I couldn't get inside to make sure it was like dry inside it. And I was afraid of it mildewing even more. So then I thought, I'll throw it in the dryer. What was I thinking? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. It was really stupid, but I threw them in the dryer. And it's dry, you know, it was it seemed to be working. And all of a sudden I kept hearing bump bump, bump bump, bump bump, and it kept getting louder and louder and louder. I went and opened up my dryer. It looked like a giant cocoon in my dryer. Apparently one of the little skeins broke loose from the herd and was rounding up everybody else. And it looked like one of those yarn, it looked like a yarn pod, like from the invasions of the body snatchers. The thing was like two feet and I could get my arms all the way around it. I could hug this thing. It was like giant. And it was this big red cocoon all the way around with these little tentacles coming off and skeins floating around at the edges of it. And if you stuffed your hand into the middle of the, of the pod, you could pop out whole, it was like little births of spawning aliens, of alien spawns of um, skeins popping out from inside. It was a nightmare. It took me forever to untwist it. I was determined I was going to try to salvage some of this yarn. Uh, the stuff that was wool had absorbed the smell so badly that I ended up throwing it out. Plus it felted as it went through. So it was like, forget that. Um, so I had big blobs of, of yellow and purple things that just kind of got tossed at that point. The rest of the yarn, some of it was cotton. I could tell that by the feel of it. Some of it, I have no idea to this day what it was. Um, so I, I worked and I worked and I worked to untangle. My husband named it Yarnzilla. And if I'm able to figure out how to do it, I will post a picture on this website so, or on this podcast so you can see what it looked like because it was kind of funny and, and I hesitated whether I should even mention one of my faux pas with yarn, but but it, my husband was like, oh, it's too funny. You got to tell him. So yeah, so Yarnzilla had to be told. So that being said, we're going to move on to the books for this week. Um, I will start out with books about wool. This one is called The Knitter's Book of Wool. It is by Clara Parks. Authors of the, she's the author of the Knitter's Book of Yarn. This is the Knitter's Book of Wool. Let's see if I can get this close. My lighting tonight is not very good because instead of filming during the daytime, I'm filming at night. We went up, I live just outside Gettysburg, and we went out to dinner. Well, an early dinner tonight. And when we left earlier today, it was really nice. It's cold. We actually had hail and like sleet come down and we forgot that it was Remembrance Week in Gettysburg. So everybody was in uniform and the drums and the fifes were going and apparently we just missed the parade. We got caught in the parade one year. Um, they like stop traffic in town and everybody parades down through town. Um, in case you've never heard of Remembrance Week in Gettysburg, it's the anniversary of when President Lincoln did the Gettysburg Address um, and dedicated the National Cemetery. So they have a Remembrance Weekend every year, and I thought we had missed it, but apparently not. We were driving through town, and like I said, all these reenactors are running around, and it's like, what is going on? And then, yeah, come to find out we had the dates wrong. But anyway, back to this book. So my, that's why my lighting's messed up tonight. Uh, so anyway, back to this book. Um, it was very good. I looked through it. It's very detailed about the breakdown of wool, and it shows the different sheep. It shows pictures of the sheep. It shows pictures of what the fibers from that sheep look like. And um, then it also has patterns in it as well. But it tells you also different characteristics of wool that comes from that particular sheep. So this was really a good book. This next one is called The Practical Spinner's Guide to Wool. It's by Kate Larson.
There it is. And this shows the detailed process from shearing to the point of spinning. And um, it was very similar to the other one. This was a good book as well. Um, none of them were bad books. They really weren't. Um, this one was pretty good too. It had a lot of pictures. It had a lot of color pictures in it, which was nice. This book also has knitting patterns in it, and it is called Spin to Knit. And it is by Shannon O'Kee. And it has patterns in it, and it tells you basically step-by-step -step spinning for the beginner. It's a knitter's guide to making yarn. This broke. This one is called the Hand Knitter's Yarn Guide. And it also, it breaks down different yarn fibers, how they're processed and how they're blended. And this is by Nikki Gabriel. And it also had a lot of nice pictures in it. So it was enjoyable to anything with pretty yarn pictures I always enjoy. So that was nice. This one is called Knit Local. It's by Tannis Gray. And it talks about well-known, or maybe not so well-known, uh, yarn producers and yarn companies in the U.S., and it has patterns in it as well. So it was interesting to just hear about some different companies I'd never heard of before. This book I really, really liked. It's called Hand Dyeing Yarn and Fleece. It's by Gail Callahan. It had really a lot of pictures. I love pictures because it's just easier to uh, be able to see what I'm reading about. It has, um, it's very thorough. It talks about all different types of dyeing methods. Uh, you can dye with food coloring. You can dye with Easter egg. Dye. You can dye with natural plants. You can dye with um, acid, acid dyes. The cake dye that you use for your cakes and your cake frostings and things, you can actually dye with that as well. Um, and you can dye with Kool-Aid, which that's what I've done. Um, I think it'd be interesting to try the acid dye, but I haven't done that yet. Apparently you have to like really like wear a mask and everything else when you do it. That might not be a good one for me to try. And the next, this is the last of the adult um, nonfiction. This is called Dying to Knit. It's by Elaine Eskesen. Eskesen? Eskesen. I think that's how it's pronounced. And this talks about the design process of dyeing. Um, it talks about combining different colors together. Um, how to come up with patterns to dye, things that you would put together. It's just the, all about the process and, and thinking it out before you do it. So this was an interesting one. Now we'll move on to some children's books. There's one that is my all-time favorite, and I didn't think to bring one from work. Um, like I said, I've worked I work for a library, so that's why I tend to be book-oriented. Um, there is a book. It's a series. Unfortunately, the author just recently passed away. But it is called the Llama Llama series. Most people are familiar with them. Llama Llama, Red Pajama. Anyway, I love Llama Llama. He's so cute. He learns all these little social skills through all the different books. Like one he learns about dealing with a bully. One he learns, I think one's called Llama Llama Time to Share. Um, the Llama Llama holiday drama is hysterical. In all of these, Llama learns a little, little lesson and Mama Llama teaches him. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with yarn, but other than wool comes off of llamas, but he's just cute. And the expressions that whoever did the illustrations for it, they just, they look like a little kid. I mean, they just look like things I've seen my children and my grandchildren do. And, and uh, they're just cute. They're adorable books, but I forgot to bring one to show you what they look like, but that whole series is cute. And I think there's maybe seven or eight books in the series, but they're adorable. Then I found this one. This is Charlie Needs a Cloak. It is by Tommy DiPaola. And there's the shepherd and the sheep. 
and it talks about how he goes about getting his cloak made and from the sheep. Then there's this, there's this little book. This is called Extra Yarn, and this is by Mac Barnett. This was a cute little book. It's about a little girl that has a magic yarn box, and the magic yarn box just never runs out of yarn, and she knits for everybody in her community. She makes things. She even knits her knits things for her trees and for her house and for her whole town gets knit things. So it's a, it's just a cute little story. And this one was adorable. It's called Edmund Unravels. It is by Andrew Kolb. It was so cute. I had not, I, I ordered this. I didn't know what it was till it came in. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's so cute. He's a little ball of yarn. Edmund's a ball of yarn. And Edmund's mom and dad are skeins of yarn, like upright skeins with little eyeballs. And he has other little brothers and sisters who also have little balls of yarn. And it talks about the adventures. He goes all over the globe and he kind of unravels his yarn from his ball as he goes to explore. But he always feels safe because there's always a tug on the other end from home to bring him back to his house again, to his mom and dad and his family. So it was just so cute. I really enjoyed this one. Uh, so that was Edmund Unravels. And I did have one other adult thing that I forgot. It just got lost in the heap. There's, and this is actually a DVD. It's called Respect the Spindle. And this is by Abby Frankmont. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's, it is all about drop spindles using drop spindles. I do have a drop spindle. I have used it before, but I haven't used it since I got my spinning wheel, uh, just because it's easier to use a spinning wheel. Um, but you know, some people enjoy drop spindles, and so this was a step-by-step how-to with the drop spindle. So that was an interesting video as well. So next week, I'm thinking we are going to do a segment since it's Christmas is coming and we're all doing shopping and all of us knitters like to knit but it's not always cheap to do so. We're going to talk about different ways to save money with knitting and knitting projects and project bags and just alternative ideas thinking outside thinking outside the project bag. Maybe that's what we'll call it. So anyway, I hope you all have a nice Thanksgiving. And speaking of Thanksgiving, I'm cooking the turkey this week, which is like totally scary. Um, I'll do a quick Thanksgiving story. When we first got married, my husband and I, you know, I didn't know how to cook a whole lot. I could bake things, but I didn't know how to cook a whole lot. And my in-laws were coming over for Thanksgiving dinner. I was not about to admit to my mother-in-law that I did not know how to cook a turkey. So, um, and I didn't want to admit to my mother that I didn't know how to cook a turkey. So I called up my father's mother, my grandmother on my dad's side. Um, she was a wonderful cook. So I called her up. I said, Grandma, I need some help. How do I cook a turkey? So she told me what to do. She told me, you know, save myself some trouble and make sure the turkey's moist by getting a cooking bag. Went out, got the cooking bag, got all the stuff for the stuffing, got all the things for the whole meal. Made the, got ready to make the whole meal and realized I didn't know what direction in the oven the turkey was supposed to go. I didn't know if it was supposed to die with its legs up or down. So I thought, I didn't want to call up. I thought that is just too stupid of a question. You know, I've pushed my luck as it is asking how to cook a turkey. I'm not about to admit I don't know how to, which direction to cook it in. So I didn't want to admit that. So I, we had some magazines laying around the house. And I thought surely one of these magazines will have a picture of somebody with a turkey in an oven, and I'll see whether its legs are up or down. No, not one. Not one magazine I had had a picture of a turkey in it. But I did see a picture of the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yes, that's how I based cooking my turkey, because they cooked the roast beast and its tail was up in the air and its legs were down, so that's how I cooked the turkey, based on Dr. Seuss. Yes, true story. So my mother-in-law comes in the door. Of course, she's going, oh, 
Katrina, it smells wonderful. Dinner smells so good. And it did really smell good. And then she opened up the oven and looked. She went, Katrina, you cooked the turkey upside down. And I went, that's why the stuffing kept falling out. That's why I couldn't keep it inside the bird. So, yeah, there was stuffing all over the inside of the pan and the bag. and It tasted fine. And actually, I sometimes intentionally cook my turkey that way because we found that the breasts stay moister. Who knew? But, um... Yeah, my first turkey was based on Dr. Seuss, so I have improved. I know how to cook one now, so I can readily admit this to people. But um, anyway, I hope you and your family have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I will see you again next week. Thanks for hanging in there. Bye-bye.